So welcome everyone and thank you for joining me for Open Up Your Research, Improving Research Integrity and Transparency Using the Open Science Framework. My name is Kevin Reed and I'm an Associate Librarian at the Health Sciences Library. And I also want to acknowledge that I'm in Saskatoon, so I'm on Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. So the plan for today is really to highlight the value of open science to examine the open science framework tool within the context of open science best practices, to explore the features of open science and its capabilities, to use case studies to demonstrate how open science can be used in practice so you can see it actually being applied in the real world. And then finally, because the open science framework is not a University of Saskatchewan sponsored product, I'm going to give you some of the advantages and disadvantages of using it to help you make an informed decision as to whether you might want to incorporate it into your research going forward. And of course, if you have questions, please feel free to, to stop me and interrupt me. You can post them in the chat or just unmute yourself and we can go through. So first of all, let's start off with what is the concept of open science and really what does it mean? And open science originated in Europe a few years ago and really highlighted the importance of making the products of research that are publicly funded, publicly accessible with no or minimal restriction. So historically, we know that a lot of research and a lot of data has been kept behind closed doors through publishers, which is only accessible to people who can afford to license or pay to access those articles. And that only ends up being the publication itself. And so what we want to think about when we think of open science is opening up all aspects of the research process. So those of us who fund publicly research in Canada or United States or across the, the world, that that research is openly available and accessible and usable. Open science is also designed to foster sharing and collaboration as early on and as early as possible in the research process. And ultimately the push towards moving forward with open science is to create a systemic change to the way science and research is done so that it's more open and it's more equitable in that people can access it whenever they need to, regardless of their status or their location in the world. So when we talk about open science, it really is an umbrella term for a lot of different concepts, whether it's open access or open research or open source or open data. You also may have heard the term open scholarship being thrown around. And really all of those are, are components of what open science is all about. And when we think about open science in the context of the open science framework tool, we're really looking at it from an open research, open data, open source, open access and equity perspective. So a tool that's going to allow you to open your research or your code or your data as soon as you start to work with it and start to create it as part of your research process. So when we think of the research lifecycle, we can sort of break this down into five major components. It's a simplified way to look at a life cycle, but still it is sort of the, the encompassing elements of what a life cycle includes. So at the idea stage, you're developing a research question, you're looking at existing research, you might be de developing a hypothesis you want to test. And then once you move to the methods of your, of your research, you're developing instruments, you're planning experiments, you're identifying participants or subjects of study that you are looking to explore to answer your research question. You're then collecting data, which may be text or numbers or images. You'd be storing data and hopefully describing it. Anyone who attended the research data management workshop will know that this is a huge part of the data management process is making sure that your research data is understandable. Once that data has been finalized and collected, we analyze it. We have an analysis plan. We probably use statistical software. And then we start to transform and analyze our data to help us answer that question. And then finally, and the ultimate goal for many of us is to publish. And that might be presenting at a conference, publishing in a journal, sharing your research data with someone else to get credit for it. And really, this is where we, we see a lot of focus and attention in terms of what our research outputs are. And so when we think about the be all end all of a publication and what's there as the only element of our research, really what I like to compare this to is to the idea that a publication is really only the tip of the iceberg. And if that publication is published in a closed journal, for example, where you need to pay to gain access to it, that limits access to your research even more. 
And so when we think about the concept of open science, we're not just opening up the publication phase of this process. We're opening up our analysis, our collection, our methods, and the idea, the root cause of what we started to do and why we're doing this research in the first place. And the goal with that is to unearth the rest of that iceberg. So whether that's our study protocol, publishing that as we start our research, our data collection plan, our code books, our analysis plan, the software we use, the code that we wrote to analyze our data, all of these things are valuable information to making our research understandable. And the more open we can make that research, the more accessible it is, the more equitable it is for people to gain access to it when they need it. So why would we want to practice open science? Really the push towards practicing open science is to help improve the transparency, the reproducibility and the reuse of research. If all of our research is openly available, other people can use it, they can interpret it, they can actually help inform other studies in collaboration with you. It also avoids the duplication of efforts. So rather than you having to reinvent the wheel every time, if we all start to release our research more openly, we may be able to use other people's methodologies or code or analysis approaches for our own research so that we don't have to recreate it from scratch. This also increases the potential for stronger collaboration. It makes publicly funded research products openly accessible and free to everyone. And ultimately, it's designed to improve equitable access to information. So if these are things that, that resonate with you and you feel like are important as you create research for your own work, this is something that is important to move forward. And we're seeing a dramatic shift towards this in research currently, especially in Canada. So when we think about transforming this research life cycle into open science and action, at every stage of the life cycle, there are specific components that you can practice to make your research more open. So at the idea stage, you can pre-register your project. So actually provide information about the project that you plan to do and how you plan to do it before you start. You can share your methods, the instruments that you create and the tools that you use to apply your idea openly as well. Similarly with data collection, you can describe your data so that it's easily understood by others. You can share your analysis plan so you can be transparent about how you run your analysis to make sure that it's reproducible, as well as you're held accountable for what you said you were going to do. And then finally, not only can you share the publication, but you can share the tools and, any, and all of the data underlying what it is you did over the course of your research project. So when we look at the open science framework, the open science framework as a tool is actually built with open science by design. So all of the things I just described, pre-registration, open methods, data management, reproducibility, and sharing of, of other products beyond the final publication are all facilitated through this tool. It is specifically designed to help you keep your research open from the very beginning of the process to the very end. So in terms of a poll, we don't have to do the poll here because there's only one person in the session. But I just want you to think about, have you ever openly shared your methods, protocols, instruments, or tools before publication? Or have you ever shared your research data before or after publication? So is this something that you've thought about doing? And this doesn't necessarily mean to be through a tool like Open Science Framework. Maybe you shared something through social media or someone reached out to you who knew you were doing research in this area and asked for something. So I just want you to consider whether you've done this before in the past. And if that's what brought you here today, that's wonderful. And I'm glad that you're tuning in for that. I see in the chat, showing research data after publication and preprints. So great. So already starting to practice open science for those of you who are in the session today, which is wonderful. So, with Open Science Framework, what I want to do in this session is really go over a lot of the different features that are available. So in Open Science Framework, you can register your work. It allows you to organize your projects, manage collaborators on your team, allow you to utilize version control of all the documents that you use, connect to existing tools that you might use to store data or code or general files about your research. And then finally, it allows you to share your work at every stage. So I'm gonna work through a couple of these before we go into a demo so you can see specifically how Open Science Framework provides these services. 
So before I do that, I want to go over some of the basics of how the Open Science Framework is set up as a general tool and as a page that incorporates all of your different research products. So this is what a general Open Science Framework page looks like. We have on this page a series of sections that distribute different information about your project in clusters. So at the beginning, we have the title of your project and any information. So this is where your contributors will be. If you have an affiliated institution associated with your Open Science Framework, that will be listed, the date you created it, and a description of that project. Remember, this description is entirely up to you to include. And when working with students and faculty in the past who have used Open Science Framework, this is a really important thing that people often overlook. You have to think about this page as the first exposure someone will have to your project. So make your description as descriptive as possible so someone understands the context of the research that you're doing. We then have a wiki, which is available for you to provide information about your project if you want. It can also be used for your team members to share notes or include meeting minutes within. So ultimately you can use this as a project tool or as a front facing tool that provides more information about your project. Below we have all of the different files that are available. This would be not only files that you use through the Open Science Framework, but if you're linking through a different tool, such as Google Drive, for example, those will also be listed there. On the bottom right hand side, one of the wonderful things about Open Science Framework is that it will log and track all the activity that you do. So anyone who works on your project who might make a change to something, whether it's a version of a file or upload something new, will be tracked there so you can keep track of what's being done when and by whom in your project. You then have project components. You can think of components as subcomponents of your larger project. So you can customize specifically who is on those components and you can even assign different licenses and information to restrict access to these if you don't want them to be seen by the public. And then finally, citation information. I always say this in any of my sessions, by you putting up your information and your research online, it's important that you get credit for the work that you do. And so as soon as you create an open science framework project, it's immediately citable. So someone who was to come to this site and potentially use some of your products of research, that citation will be available for you there. So you can use it in any form. And I'll demonstrate that in a little bit. And then finally, we have the menu bar at the top. So the menu bar is going to give you different options around linking your paper to registrations. It's going to have the file information available to you, as well as being able to access contributors. So this is really your menu where you can decide on a lot of the logistics of your project. Any questions about that so far? Okay, great. So now let's get into some of the key open science framework features as they relate to actually practicing open science in earnest. So when it comes to registering your work, the Open Science Framework has an entire section on pre-registration. And so the goal of pre-registration is to make your hypothesis, your analysis plan, or your entire project plan public before you begin your research project. What it does is it creates a time-stamped immutable version of your project. So it'll indicate the date you registered it, and that you have an indicated timeline for when you plan to complete it. The benefit of doing a pre-registration is it improves the transparency, reproducibility, and discoverability of your research, and it's going to hold you accountable for what you've said you're going to do. So if you mention you're going to do an analysis a certain way, and then you change that over time, people want to see that you've accounted for why that's happened. It also can link directly to your Open Science Framework project. The link to OSF registries is available on the bottom of the slide, and I'll be showing it in the chat and, dem and demoing it a little bit later. The other benefit of this is that you as an individual can look through OSF registries to see if research in your area is already being done or is already underway. So this isn't just something for you to do, but it's also something for you to use as a tool to see if other research in your area is being registered in the same way. The next piece of this is being able to organize projects. So I talked a little bit about components before, but you can group files 
in, and different content for your project into specific sections called components. They really serve as subcategories within a hierarchical project structure. So if I have a major project title, like the one here, which is about the Mediterranean diet, these are subcategories of that project that relate to my hypothesis, to my methods, to my analysis. And ultimately I can control the components because they become their own type of independent project. So if I don't want other people to be a part of specific components, I can restrict collaborators to only certain components that I want. So it's a really nice way to create subsets and substructures of your work and also dictate who and who cannot access them as you work through it. You can also manage collaborators in a project. So you can assign different permission levels to any contributor in your project. What's important is that all contributors must have an OSF account. So I'll demo this in a few minutes, but when you go to add a contributor and search for someone, they will only appear if they've created an OSF account themselves. So if you plan to work on a team in the Open Science Framework, make sure that everyone has an account before you start your project. You'll also notice that you have the option of, of setting permissions like administrator or read and write options. And you'll see a little checkbox on the right called bibliographic contributor. And what that means is that maybe you're working with someone who is only working on this project for a short period of time and hasn't really put in the amount of effort that it would mean to include them as someone in the citation for your project. So you can actually remove that check mark and then they would not necessarily be included in the final citation that's displayable on the Open Science Framework page. We then have one of the really wonderful features of Open Science Framework, which is version control. So generally the Open Science Framework offers free storage for five gigabytes for private projects. And if you make your project open, it will actually give you 50 gigabytes. So a dramatic increase and, and a real clear indication that the Open Science Framework wants you to make your research public and they're rewarding you for doing so by giving you more access. And storage is limited per project. So great question. So yes, it is per project. You can also track all the versions of the files that utilize Open Science specific storage. So if you're using storage through the Open Science Framework and you upload files with the same name within the same folder, you will see the different version and the changes that were made and by whom in your project. So if you're ever worried about going back to an older version, you can see the revisions in the, the diagram at the bottom here on the right. And you can see that in this particular instance, there was a script run in R that has four separate versions. And so you can go back and see the original version if you want, but ultimately you'll be able to see the newest version first. And again, it's going to log and track every change made to a project. Another benefit of the Open Science Framework is that it can sync with many other tools that are going to help you find, store, and analyze data. And you can actually import your files or your data from any of the tools shown on this page. The changes in, made in these tools will be reflected on the Open Science Framework, but the versioning is not quite as strong as it would be if you were using Open Science Framework storage. So what I mean by that is that if you're working on something in Google Drive, and you make changes in Google Drive, you will see that change happen in the Open Science Framework, but you won't see a version difference in the Open Science Framework. So all of that is being done locally within the tools you see here. So you don't get quite the same level of granularity and storage that you would if you were to use the Open Science Framework storage itself. And then finally, through the Open Science Framework, you have the ability, obviously, to share your work. That is the main reason why you would use the Open Science Framework. And the benefit to this is you can share any type of research output. The OSF also provides the ability to assign a digital object identifier to your project. So if any of you attended the Research Data Management Workshop, an object identifier allows you to show proof that you have a permanent place for your research online, and it's great for complying with funder requirements. And so by having it there, it's giving you a citable research product in your Open Science Framework project. You also have the ability to apply a license to your projects. So if you don't want someone to use your research for commercial purposes, you can dictate that through the license agreements available on the Open Science Framework. 
And all the projects are citable in any format, as you can see here on the right hand side, where my cursor is. And there's also a preprint server that can actually publish research before peer review. So I, I've included a link there to the OSF preprints. And again, as you start this project with your registration, you store all your data and your research in the Open Science Framework, and then you register a preprint or you submit a preprint, all of that data and the information about your research is connected across that entire life cycle. So a really useful tool for keeping track of everything and keeping everything open as we work through that process. Are there any questions about that process so far or anything that I've talked about with the Open Science Framework to date? Okay, so now what I'd like to do is just go over a few examples of case studies of my own work to give you an example of how the Open Science Framework can work in practice. So the first case study is a research project I recently completed and published, and it was about analyzing publications that were funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to look at their data sharing practices. And the products of this research were a study protocol, we used code to extract data from PubMed. We had raw data. I built a data collection instrument used to extract data from the raw. I have a data analysis plan. And then finally, those analyzed data sets. So let's just take a look at what that looks like in practice. So here we have my Open Science Framework project. I have my other co-authors listed on the project. I have the category it's available in. I have a description. I have a license, which is CC BY, meaning it's freely accessible to use by anyone. And then I have my information stored in different components. So I have my methods, my raw data, and my data analysis, all stored and available here on this page. Now, what's great about this is that before I built this project, I actually pre-registered it online. So if you click up on the registrations button at the top here, you can see any registrations associated with the project. And so here is my specific project registration that I submitted in January of 2020. So this is what I wrote and this was my approach. And I included some documentation with my protocol and data dictionary before I started. And then from there, I can see where it was registered from. So I have my specific project and it will take me directly to all my data. Now you'll notice that on this page, I also submitted a preprint. So it says has supplemental materials on the OSF preprint page. So as soon as you register a preprint and link it back to your open science framework, all of this information is connected. So now I could select this <clears throat> link and it will take me directly to my preprint. So here's my preprint, which now shows me the supplemental material, which again is back on the open science framework page we were just on. It gave me a DOI for my preprint. And then finally, because our paper was recently published, I now have a link directly to the peer reviewed publication. So I could click on that link and it will take me directly back to the actual publication itself, which is also linked through. So I've created a seamless thread of all of my research through the open science framework from the beginning of the project through registration all the way to the end to the final publication where people can now see all of that research available in one place. As another example, which is a little bit different in that this was actually a software project that I was a part of, we actually utilized Open Science Framework's connection to existing tools. So if I click on this link, what it will show me is that in this case, we used a different license, which is general public license because it's code. And this is back when I worked at NYU. And this restricts commercial entities from using our code for their purposes. And so now if I select and move down through the project, you can see again, we have a link through to Google Drive where we keep all of our documentation. And then all of my code is connected through GitHub. So whatever is existing on my GitHub page, which is a software management tool that allows you to upload code and store documents related to that code is all tied in and connected here. So you can see that you can use the open science framework for many different kinds of, of ways. So whether you're working on an open source software project that you want to make discoverable and available and provide useful documentation, or you're working on an individual research project 
it really suits both needs associated with that. Okay. Any questions about that process to this point? Okay. So let's go through, it is now halfway through the session and I wanna spend the remainder of the session really going through an open science demo. And to do that, what I'd like you to do is, is to follow along if you can. So I'm just going to move out of the page and I'm gonna paste this into the chat. And if you'd like, you can create an open science framework account. It's very simple to do and I'm gonna take us there right now. And then we can create a test project and work through it together. So I'm going to move over to the main open science framework page. So this is the OSF homepage. And through the OSF homepage, you can sign up for an account right here using the green button. It's very simple. You just put in your full name, your contact email, and a new password, and ensure that you're not a robot. Those of you who are familiar with ORCIDs, which is a universal ID for researchers that keeps track of all your public, published outputs, if you have that, it's a wonderful way to sign up and link it directly to your ORCID profile. Or if you have an institutional account, which USASC does not, would also allow you to log in. Now, as I mentioned before, Open Science Framework has many different components. So if I click down on the Open Science Framework page, you can see here that I have the option for preprints, for registries. People can also host free conferences on the Open Science Framework, a topic I'm not going to cover in detail today. But let's start off with registries at the beginning of the project. So through the OSF registries page, you can see here all of the new registrations that have come out in the past day or the past week. They are uploaded based on the way they are created. And so you can search for registrations as you'd like, and it will allow you to explore specific areas of your own research to see if other people are working on something similar to you and whether or not you want to reach out to them to collaborate or get ideas off of, or potentially even decide that the project you're working on is too similar. So registries are great for that purpose because it's going to allow you to find that type of information. Similarly, we can also look at the preprints page and when we look through the preprints page, you can browse by subject to see specifically what you're looking for. So I could say, okay, I'll look in the medicine and the health sciences because that's what's interested to me. And I can scroll down and basically limit to all of the different types of preprint servers that are available. So one of the great things about the open science framework is that it's actually bringing in every preprint server or, or the majority of them that are available and aggregating them in one place. So you can click on any of these to see what's available through them and it will take you directly to those projects where those preprints are. So really wonderful for that purpose. So because we're focusing on open science framework as a tool, I, want us, I wanted to show you that, but focus on the, the, the majority of the tool, the open science framework proper. So I'm going to sign in with my own account. And we'll work through starting a project together. So once you log in to an account, you have a dashboard of all of the existing projects that you've worked on in the Open Science Framework. So as you can see, I've worked on quite a few here and they're date and time stamped with my collaborators associated with them. I can also search for my projects if I want, but today what I'm going to focus on is creating a new project. So if you'd like to follow along, please do so now. So I'm gonna create a new project. And for this, I'm just gonna say, Test Open Science Workshop Project. Because I used to have a prior affiliation, it's giving me the option of selecting NYU. I don't want it to be NYU, so I can click Remove All. If you've never had a previous affiliation, you should see nothing there. You'll also notice now that there is a storage location. So there are four separate storage locations available to you. You can choose whichever you want. But if you feel like it's important to keep your research in Canada hosted on Canadian servers, that's the option that you would choose. From there, there's a more drop down button. And this is where you can provide a description of your project for USASC workshop. And one of the benefits, as I mentioned before, is you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So maybe you have a great practice of how you like to structure your projects, 
how you like to keep them organized. And because of that, you can actually select an existing project as a template. So if I wanted to search for my Canadian research through CIHR and I want to follow that template every time, I could select that template and it would bring up the exact same structure as I used for that previous project. So you don't have to worry about recreating it every single time. You can just pick a template and go. And so that's one of the real benefits of Open Science Framework is it's also going to make your research more efficient that way. So now let's create this project. And what it will do is automatically take me to that project. So I either can keep working in my dashboard or go directly to my project. So at this point, I can see that I have my name, the test workshop itself, I have the data was created, I don't have a description yet, and I can also have the option. So my description is here, test example. If I want to change that, I can just click on it and keep writing. And then I have the option of choosing the license. So as I mentioned before, there are many different licenses available. So I could click on this and say, okay, I want to use CC BY Attribution 4.0 International, which means it's freely available online, it's the most permissive, and you can start to move towards less permissive as you work through. So each of these has their own indication, which you can look up to see specifically what these different licenses require. But the reason you do this is because it restricts what people can do with the information you share on this tool. So let's just say for now, I'm gonna choose CC BY because I want it to be open. And then you can see the policy listed of what's available. So I, I highly recommend that you read it to make sure that you're comfortable with what you're doing with your data or your research as you work through. From there, you have the wiki. So we can either decide now to dive into the specific components, but maybe we wanna first add contributors. So what I'm going to go to is up to the top to the contributor section. And you'll see now that I'm listed as an administrator. I have bibliographic contributor because I'm the only person on the project. And if I wanna add somebody new, I would click add and I would search for them. So I'm gonna search for my colleague, Sarah Rutley. And I run the search and there's Sarah there and I can add her as a contributor. So because Sarah already has an account, I can see who she's tied to and I can easily access her and bring her into the project. I'm not gonna do that just because I don't want her to get an update for a project that doesn't exist, but that's exactly how you would go through the process. And then Sarah's name would be listed below right here. The next thing I would do after adding contributors is to see if I want to include any add-ons in my project. So at this point, I'm going to click on the add-ons button on the top menu bar. And these are the different add-on tools that I can use. So let's say, for example, that I wanted to bring in code from GitHub. So I could click on enable. And what it's going to do is bring up specific terms for what's available from GitHub directly. So it's telling me I can view download versions, I can add and update files, I can delete files, and I can have logs, but forking or registering my content can't be done in this tool. So I'm going to confirm. And then at that point, I now have the option to configure my add-ons. So what I can do is import my account from the profile, log into GitHub, and choose any of my GitHub projects that I want included, and they will show up in my file directory. So you could do that for any of these above, whether it's Dropbox or Figshare or OneDrive, for example, all of those can be connected and imported into your Open Science Framework project. Any questions about that so far? Okay. So I'm gonna go back to my project. You can always go back through the menu at the top left-hand side. And now what I want to do is I, I want to add a new file to my project. So I have many ways to do this. I can click on the specific section and I can upload a file. I can also create folders within my storage section deciding what I want to include. And also it allows me to download entire folders as zips should they be there. Now, the other thing I can do is I can simply take a file. So here I have a spreadsheet that I've been using. And I can simply click and drag it into my file. So now I have this OSF project available, this demo CSV file. And let's say I wanted to make a change to that. So I'm going to open up this file. 
and I have a spreadsheet right here. And I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. And I'm going to delete all of the URLs from it. So now I'm going to delete it. I've removed that entire column. I'm going to save it. And now I can close this. And again, because the file name is the exact same, I can go back and I can copy it into my folder again. And although I don't see a change, now when I click on that file, what it's going to allow me to do is it's going to show that it's the second version. So one, first of all, I get a perfect look at what my spreadsheet looks like available online. And if I want to see the revisions, I can click on the revisions tab right here on the right. And so if I would prefer to see the first version, I could select it and it will show me exactly what I had for the first version. So I've got my first column there. So as long as you keep your file names the same, they're going to provide you with a way to keep versioning updated as you work through your project. So you don't have to worry about file naming it a certain way or using track changes for something else. So it's a really great way to do that. If you're working in version two as well, you'll also see that you have the ability to check out a file. So if you check out a file, what it means is that somebody else could not upload, delete or change that file while it's checked out. And then you can just simply check it back in. You can also choose to download it if you want. So you'll notice now that I moved away from the main project page and we're in the file section here. Okay. Now we'll go back to the test workshop. So if you wanted to add anything to the wiki, it's very simple. You just expand it here through the wiki itself and you can start typing things. So this, here we go over here. This is an example of how to use the wiki for this project. And then I can go down and I can click save. And now that will be posted on the page itself. And I can create as many wiki pages as I want. So if you want to have information or a wiki page about your methodology or about your data that helps explain what your data is or a user guide, all of that can be listed and available through the wiki. And then when you go back to your main project page, you can see that now I have an example of what my wiki is here. So now let's say you want to create specific subsections of your project. And this is where components come into play. So if I wanna add a component, I can just select add a component. And again, it's going to take me through the same process that we took as if I was creating a new project for the first time. So let me say, I'm just gonna say, this is our method section. Again, I'm going to remove my affiliation. And now I have the option of adding the contributors from the larger project. So let's say I work with seven or eight people and I want all of them to have access to the methods folder. Well, then I would just select this option and it would bring them all in. But if I only wanted specific people to have access to my method section, I would then remove that and actually dictate who gets access to it when. I then can have more. So again, I could provide a description, methods example for this OS workshop project. <clears throat> and now for descriptive purposes, I have the option of providing a little bit of an indication of what's in this folder. So this just gives you a nice way to highlight specifically what it is that you're including. So now I can select methods and measures because it's closely aligned with what I want to create. And then I create that component. And so now I can go to that new component and you'll see that a new little arrow pops up on the left-hand side. So now I have my method section, which is underneath my test workshop project. And again, I can add contributors and this would be specifically to the methods, not to my broader project. So every time you create a new component, which you'll also notice you can create components within components. So you can make as many hierarchies as you'd like. So you get to dictate every time who has access to what. You also have the option of only making some things private and some things public. So it's just a nice way to control access to your information. And if I ever wanna go back to my broader project, I can click on the test workshop. And now you'll notice that I have my method section here and a new, subcategory in my files has also been created here. So you can continue to add components as you want. So I could say, now I wanna add data. 
I could remove them all. And I could say data for project. And from there, I can choose data instead and create it. Now I can go to my new component. And again, I have the option of making that specific component public or not, or I can go back to my main project. And now I have a data component as well. So all of these give you the option and the flexibility to decide what gets made available openly and what does not. Once you've, you're comfortable with what you have available, so you, you have all the components you've built, you can also add tags to enhance discoverability. So I could say education, I could say OSF, open science. And what will happen is when people search for these things, they will find them and have them be available and discoverable. You'll also notice at the bottom, everything I've done has been tracked in my recent activity as well. And then finally, once you've decided that you're comfortable with your structure, you're happy that the wiki makes sense, or at least for the time you're ready to make it public, you would then actually go up to the top here and make this project public. So what it will say once you do that is it's going to give you a warning. So it will say, please review your projects for any sensitive or restricted information. So again, you're not going to use the open science framework if you're working with sensitive data. But once you, they're made public, you should assume they will always be public. You can return them to private later, but because Google is scanning these tools, there may be a snippet of information that's always tracked online. So then I can click continue. And now I have the option of choosing what I make public. So do I just want the workshop project or do I also want my data and methods? Maybe you're not comfortable sharing your data, but the methodology you use is okay. So you can select that and then click continue. <clears throat> and then it will say, again, just to make sure that you're comfortable, are you willing to make these things public? And then at that point you would confirm and it would be publicly displayed and searchable through the Open Science Framework page, as well as on Google or any other tracking uh, mechanism like Google Scholar, for example, where the, it'll be able to find your project online. So that's really a brief run through of the entire open science framework and how it works. It's really ultimately a place for you to make your research open as you go in a way that's comfortable for you. So this might be a tool that some researchers use for their entire project as their organizational system, whereas others may only use it as a sharing tool exclusively. So they're not necessarily using it to work on the project as they go through, but once something is completed, they'll upload it online to the open science framework. So with that, I'm going to return to the slideshow and just see if there's any questions or information you'd like me to demo that I wasn't answered in what I just demonstrated in the last 10 minutes. I'll take a sip of water too. Okay. Oh, I see one. Yes, that's a great question. So the question is, can different components have different licenses? And that is correct. So you can assign an entirely different license to a software section or to the data section, to your method section. So maybe with, with your methodology, you're fine keeping it free and openly available. With your data, you only want it to be used for specific purposes or the same with your code. So every component you create has that ability to set a totally different license for it as you work through it. So again, you can set protections and levels of protection depending on the type of information that you're sharing online and available. And if you're not comfortable, you can keep something totally private the entire time, only until you feel comfortable making it available as well. Great question. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of the open science framework, because I think it's important that not all tools are the best tools we can possibly use. Uh, and I just want to highlight why I have found Open Science Framework a really helpful tool for my research, and but also what I have found particularly frustrating about it. So I think for me, the pros of it generally are, is it's a one-stop shop for making your project totally open. So my last research project, from the, the day I started to the day it was finished, I was able to make everything openly available because my research was 
able to be facilitated that way. I didn't have sensitive data to share. So I was willing and able to share everything as I went through and also share my project with people as the project kept going. So as I uploaded new documents, I would share to listeners or social media that that was available so that my colleagues were, would actually see it and provide me with feedback. I think it's a very intuitive, flexible, and easy to use tool. You can get started very quickly and feel comfortable with it. The ability to get credit for the work that I've done and restrict what people can do with it through licensing is a huge plus for me. It's also easy to manage collaborators and project components. So I have worked on OSF projects throughout my career at three different institutions, and I've been able to leave certain projects or bring certain parts of them over and share that collaborator piece really easily. And I find 50 gigabytes of storage capacity is nothing to sneeze at. And the version control that's available to you really goes a long way to making your research more transparent. I think for most people, when I've worked with them, some of the cons that come up with Open Science Framework is that really it requires adaptation from your research workflow. And change is hard and people don't like to change. And so a lot of people who have been resistant to the Open Science Framework, in my experience, are those who are comfortable with what they're already doing. And adding the Open Science Framework to that is just another tool that they need to use. Also, if you're interested in seeing how many downloads you can get from different parts of your project, that isn't really available to you through the Open Science Framework. So the only thing you can really see is how many people accessed your pages over the course of time. So if I was to, to go back to the Open Science Framework now, let me see if I can go back to the project I was working on. And I can look at analytics, for example. When you look at the analytics themselves, all you get is unique visits and time of day visits and where they're referred from. So if someone comes in and downloads a file from your project, you would not be able to see how many times that happened, what file they were most interested in, and I find that extremely frustrating. I also find that working with add-ons makes versioning unstable. So if you plan to use Google Drive, which I've done for projects in the past, it can be great because it's making the changes in Open Science Framework, but I don't get to see that, that visibility of the changes over time in the project itself. And I find that this is getting much better. So when I posted that preprint, people reached out to me because they found it through their Google Scholar profile or they found it through the web somehow or through a different update that they had based on a search they were doing of the web. So discoverability is getting better, but not everyone is using Open Science Framework. So you have to keep take that with a grain of salt and make sure that as you use it and you think about how you're going to use it to make sure that it's going to be discoverable and the project you're working on will be discoverable for your needs specifically. So just to wrap up, really, I hope that this particular presentation has helped you consider the value of opening up your research to increase transparency and access. The Open Science Framework is really one of the only tools that is going to enable open science practice at every stage of the research process. It's really ideal if you have a desire or interest in making your research products open, you wanna control the terms of use of how they're being actually applied and used by other people and have your work cited to make sure that you get credit. But I want to acknowledge that before you use Open Science Framework and go whole hog, really consider your research needs and workflows. Is it a suitable tool for you to use for your research currently? And finally, I, always, I want you to remember the fact that this isn't only on you. By using the Open Science Framework, it's also opening you up to finding tools about your data, your methods, et cetera. So, Please remember that because it's always going to be a resource for you to find research that's out there and potentially things that you can use for your own research, whether that be a, a new collaboration or a new methodology or an analysis approach that you hadn't thought of that you could use. So if you're interested, there are a number of resources available. I've included a link to a series of training videos on the Open Science Framework that are very brief in case you want to just get a quick refresher after this course that you can follow. There is an Open Science Framework guide through the Open Science Framework page and a YouTube video I've included there too. And just in case you're interested in seeing how Open Science Framework is being applied in other labs, I've included links to a few papers that publish explicitly how they're using Open Science Framework for their own research projects. 
So I highly recommend taking a look at those if this is what you're interested in and you're curious about how, the, how other people are using it. So with that, I'll thank you for your time. If you have any questions about open science or the open science framework whatsoever, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll post the post session survey in the link. And thank you for attending the session and for your time today. And with that, I'll stop the recording.